long ago it was spoken what went she out to see a reed shaken by the wind and the word returned much more than a reed shaken by the wind we came into embodiment all of us less than 100 years ago less than 50 years ago less than 25 years ago and some even less than 15 or 16 years ago yet somehow or other we have been almost forced or conscripted into accepting the fact that what the world has told us is so, that there has been no tampering with the Word of God, but tampering with everything else in existence. And so tonight we want to say to you all that we are not tonight going to say all that could be said. We will say only a part. And all that could be said has not even been said to this generation. We have heard some truth. We have heard error mingled with it. And who really is to blame? Our role is not to fix blame, to criticize, to condemn. But our role is if possible to find out what is real all traditions that we have received have reported truth to us all traditions have reported to us error this is not necessarily the fault of any one segment most of us were born into a faith or out of a faith we come into this world not knowing exactly from whence we came. But I would point out tonight to all of you that we came from a common source. And that common source is the source to which our soul will return. We came forth for a purpose and fulfilled or unfulfilled our soul will return at the close of this embodiment. Right or wrong, we are going someplace. We are moving through time because the sand in the hourglass is falling all the time. And someday, our lot, our portion, will be no more. Therefore, we ask the question, why are we here? And we know, all of us know, if we have any faith at all in the universe, that there must be a purpose. Naturally, in this manipulative world, where people all the time are trying to manipulate people, only the truth can make us free. But what is the truth? Christ stood before Pilate. And Pilate asked the question, what is truth? We ask the question today, and we should understand that truth is relative. There are half-truths, there are full-truths, there are relative truths, and we have much to learn as a race. And I say this not from an ivory tower, but humbly acknowledging that I have from day to day, by God's grace, learned more of the truth. And I do not feel that we have it all. I feel that truth is progressive by nature and cannot be codified into a creed with impunity. When we put it into a creed, it becomes the letter that killeth. We want the spirit that giveth life because we came forth from spirit. I believe that the world ought not to be a place of hatred, a place of darkness, a place of despair, where most of us seek 
a palliative, a pleasure, or a series of pleasures as a substitute for divine experiences. Have you ever read, in the case of Philip, one of the disciples, how that he was one place and then the Spirit of the Lord suddenly picked up Philip and carried him perhaps 30 miles or more away in an instant. We live in a time where people want instant love, instant oatmeal, instant understanding, instant everything. Well, it happened in those days. The Spirit picked him up and carried him. In our experiences and travels in the Far East, we have learned that it is nothing for the masters to pick a person up in the Himalayas, to wrap their cloak around someone, and then in a fraction of a second to have them 100, 150, 200, 500 miles away, just as you snap your fingers. Jesus Christ practiced this by location because you see in reality what is bound is our physical being. We think in terms of being fixed in space, one place only at a time. In reality, the soul that is free within us because it is related to the omnipresence of God that is everywhere, can be everywhere. I remember one time when I was in high school and uh, there was a man coming to the high school by the name of Marcus the Magician. And so, because my first name is Mark, I thought this was very thrilling. And I tried to almost play the role of the Walter Mitty role, you know, of thinking that I was this man. And so he came to our high school and one of the dramatic presentations which he made was putting a horse into a tent on the stage. A horse, mind you. And then he put a young lady, not in hot pants, but in the closest thing to it, in a tent on the other side. And then he took a gun out and he fired into the air and in the midst of all the smoke and everything, suddenly the tent with the horse in collapsed and was just hanging by the rope. The horse was gone. And then across the stage, the other tent collapsed. And then he fired the gun again and lo and behold, this tent filled out with the lines of a horse and he went over to the tent over here and he unzipped it and out stepped the girl and the horse came out of the other tent. I never did figure out just how he did. So I can't tell you. <laughs> but it happened. And it should perhaps cause us to realize that there are illusions in the world and we see them all the time on television and uh, we see them at magic shows and we read about them. But there are such things as true by location of identity. People, when they come to realize who they are, when they actually learn the powers that are resident in man's life, are able to use these powers. But these powers are the very powers that a man ought not to be concerned with at all, because they're not really too important. What is important is the reunion or rejoining of oneself to God because this world is intended to be a place of exquisite beauty, exquisite beauty within. You know, several years ago, there was a politician, I believe down in Tennessee, who was able to play a guitar. And through the power of music, he was elected to public office. A great man once said, I do not care who writes your laws if I can write your music. And why is this so? Because harmony is a gift of God and is a part of the nature of God. 
Have you ever gone into a home, any of you, anyone's home, where perhaps a terrible happening had occurred? Uh, it may have been a battle between a husband and a wife. It may have been a tragedy between parent and child. It may have been almost anything. And you came in after it happened. And as you walked into this room, I'm sure most of you have had this experience, you suddenly got a very depressed feeling. You did not know what had actually happened in this room until later. But you see, circumstances affect things. I'm going to explain. In matters of vibration, as some of the young men of our time would refer to the vibes, but to most of you who are not perhaps acquainted with this vernacular, I am referring to the vibrations, which is actually more or less an electronic fluctuation of the atomic structure. Now, in such a thing as a tape recorder, for example, what actually takes place is that magnetically we are attaching a specific fluctuation of vibrations to our tape. And it is very, very easy afterward to put this tape recorder through the gate, perhaps the flux gate of vibration, run it through, and what happens? We reproduce the same sound over again, and on and on in many cases. The same event takes place in a circular manner on a phonograph record. Actually, if you could enlarge the phonograph record, and you can, you would see that you have tiny miniature grooves going around the circle. And these grooves are like roadbeds that rise and fall. They undulate, and the undulation records the vibration. So it is not a strange thing to us to understand that substance is plastic and records vibration or frequency responses. Let us understand this a little better then. Substance itself records vibration. The walls of a room, the seat of a bus or airplane, train or boat, our clothing. If you go into a tavern, for example, or a place where foul and vile language is being used consistently, and you hang your clothing there, it not only comes out with the smell of smoke, but it also has the vibrations of the place upon it. Now, vibration has a tendency to lessen. We call it the decay rate. You will find the same thing happening in our tape recordings or our phonograph records. Our stylus eats up the road, and after a while we discard our records. And the magnetism on our tape recorders does not of necessity hold forever this frequency that we have recorded there. Do you see? And so there is a lessening response to vibrational patterns. The overcoat that we have carried into a dingy room where bad language is being used and certain vibrations are impinging themselves or hitting the actual molecules and atomic structure of our coat, lessens. Mama hangs it out on the clothesline. And the fresh air comes along and after a while somehow or other, it becomes so lessened that we no longer feel these vibrations. Now, I want to point out that man does influence man by vibration because vibrations are infectious, both good and bad vibrations. Somehow or other, though, it's a little easier to throw a tomato up into the air and then, if we don't catch it, watch it come down and squish upon the ground. But it's very difficult to throw the tomato up and it doesn't come down. <laughs> because we know that everything that goes up has to come down according to the law of gravity. So you see, vibrations rise and fall. And it is easier for vibrations to fall than it is for them to rise. In order to make them rise, to levitate, we need something to do it. But music is the most wonderful thing in the universe to actually raise our spirits. Let a band go by 
and just watch how your heart may begin to skip a beat. And then you get that feeling, perhaps it's a martial air. In our case today, in our time, we enter elevators in various places and we hear some music that actually wants to pull our whole body, our whole atomic structure apart. And because we were raised perhaps in that vibration, we are willing to accept that this is just what we want because it may affect our spinal column at certain points upon our spinal column with what has been referred to as our chakras in such a manner that it releases the lowest form of energy into our consciousness. No, I'm not going to condemn it. I'm just telling you about it. I'm telling you about the laws of vibration because everyone enters the veil of time through the gate of time and comes into a hostile world or an environment that may or may not be the environment that they want. Do you see? It may not be the, the environment that God wants, but it is the situation here, right now, in our world. So we have a rather confused world. Poor people all over the world, hungry people, and this has been for centuries and centuries of time, and spiritually hungry people who go to the fount hoping to drink of that fount out of the cup, the chalice, and find nothing there. So what we should do is understand that the fountain we want to drink of is the fountain of truth, the fountain of truth that will change our whole vision of life until we're able to realize quite suddenly that life not only can be beautiful, it is beautiful. But why and how and where? Why is it beautiful? Because God made it so. Where is it beautiful? In God's consciousness and man's consciousness when it attunes with God consciousness. Where and why? Why is it beautiful? It's beautiful because the nature of God is beautiful. Well, a young lady came up to me today as I was speaking down at the Unitarian Church. And she said to me, Who makes the masters? Who makes the masters? The masters. And I answered her very simply, because the master gave me the answer. I said to her, the masters make the masters, or you do. She said, you mean I can become a master? I said, certainly. Because a master is perfect. And I said, if you were God, would you create imperfectly? And she said, no. And I said, he didn't. And so God made everything perfect. Why is it not perfect today? The whole answer is so simple that it almost blows your mind. <laughs> the reason that it is not perfect today is because of the dichotomy where man has the divine image inside of himself, side by side with the human image. And he has free will and he allows his energy that comes from his divine presence through the crystal cord to his holy Christ self and flows down into his being, he diverts it over to the human image. And he keeps right on building up that wonderful ego, which I don't advocate that you destroy, but we should understand how to harness it. Our ego is a horse on which we ought to ride, not be ridden. As it is now, it's like the old story of the man who was crossing the bridge, and he had a donkey, and uh, he had a little young son. And so they were both leading the donkey along, and the gentleman came along and he said, how very, very foolish. Why in the world are you both walking when the donkey is well able to carry you both? Well, he thought he would try it himself because he was older than the son, so he got on first and then the son led the donkey and someone came along and they said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, old man. There you are, riding that donkey. 
Why don't you let your little son get on? So he put his son on. Another man came along and he said, why, this is ridiculous. He said, that donkey's able to carry a boat. Second time, so they both hopped on the donkey. The donkey went across another bridge and then they were coming to another bridge and a man came along and he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, both of you riding that poor donkey. Why don't you carry the donkey? <laughs> so they whittled a pole out and leather thongs and they tipped the donkey upside down and they carried him over the stream and the thongs broke right in the middle and down he went into the stream and that's all, that's exactly what happened, you see. Because human opinions would drive us half crazy if we let ourselves and we never understand the truth because the truth is so simple. And that is what is wrong today with the world. We have a case where everybody recognizes something's wrong with the world. You and I recognize it, all of us. We recognize that. We know there's something wrong with ourselves. But there's an awful lot right with ourselves, too. But somehow or other, we have a tendency to hang to personal guilt and national guilt and condemnation, criticism, judgment of each other. Christ didn't come into the world for that purpose. He came into the world to give the abundant life, to confer upon man a sense that is native to eternity. The great white brotherhood, and this is not racial, this refers to the spiritual body of world servers from the level of the ascended masters, the same level that Jesus functions, and the level of the angelic beings. It refers to the Great White Brotherhood. The Great White Brotherhood works and serves constantly to illumine mankind. Here at La Tourelle, in Colorado Springs and throughout many parts of the world, the Summit Lighthouse is teaching more and more people these great laws of freedom and cutting people free from hidebound tradition that robs man of his sense of worth that makes him feel worthless. He can't accomplish anything as long as he does not understand where he came from and where he's going. And the brotherhood shows that God did not just make one person. Now you know that. You say, well, I already know that. But you don't quite understand the mission of Jesus Christ. The man Jesus seems to you to be also the Christ. Jesus. And it is so. Jesus the Christ, the man Jesus, and he who was before Abraham. Did you ever hear this? They came to Jesus and they called him good master. And what did he say? Why callest thou me good? There is only one good, and that's God. Somehow or other, when we hear these things, we don't quite delve deeply enough into it to realize what he was talking about. He was trying to show them that the goodness was in the allness of God rather than in the individual person. Although it was resident in the individual, it needed to be brought out and polished and refined and made worthy by conformity. For man is a dual being. Man has a soul, he has a consciousness. It's all put together in a physical body. And what happens? People say, I'm that body, that's me. Give me a ticket to Las Vegas, please. You understand. I mean, they think when they carry the physical person that they're carrying everything there. And of course, it seems to be so, but why is it so? Because of that little tag along kite that comes behind us so beautifully, the consciousness why we are more consciousness than anything else. We're more energy and we're electronic in nature because the nature of God is electrons. And what do we see in this universe but a stream, a constant stream of electrons everywhere. And the electrons build form. They build the molecules. They are the building blocks of substance. You put it all together. But then if you lay it in an inert manner, upon a table and it is not energized by the divine presence. If energy doesn't flow down into the being of man, we have a stillborn babe. 
I remember when John Christopher was born, I was actually present physically at the birth. And when the child came out, there he was, like a little white marble statue. And he was inert. And then the doctor spanked him. One resounding crack, and I watched like the sunrise was coming up right near his heart. A little roseate dawn of energy pulsing through this white marble. And I thrilled as I saw that energy flow over every body, energizing life and limb. And he began to move and cry out. And I saw in that miracle of life, the miracle of myself and of yourself and of everyone, this is the physical man. And then, of course, in the view we later had of the placenta, do you know what that means? The place of entra, of entry. I'm saying that deliberately the way I did. The place where you see there enters a soul. And what does it look like, the placenta? The placenta is round, and it seems to have the rays of the sun coming out in the tracings of the vein upon it. And so it is a most wondrous manifestation. It is the little home of our tiny child for nine solid months, about like a basketball, and yet filled with a living being. But this physical being is not the real self. It is only the home the place where the soul enters, the placenta. Let us understand then that man has come into this world for the purposes of gaining soul growth. For the teachings of re-embodiment are most magnificent. And they were taught by Jesus and St. Francis of Assisi taught them in the public square. The reason that our churches do not ordinarily teach these things today, although believed by men like General Patton and Risa Stevens and over three quarters of the world's population believes in it, the reason we don't teach it today in the churches is because in earlier councils of the church when it was actually solidified under one head before the separation of Martin Luther, for example, the activity of many of the priests and bishops and councils and the Holy Rota was to change these doctrines at the instigation of Theodora and Justinius. And this, of course, is reported by Edgar Cayce in some of his writings, which he took from other writings, which are authenticated. And so we should realize that man has tampered with the Holy Scriptures. And the doctrine of re-embodiment that was taught by Jesus is denied mankind today. He does not understand that as a man soweth, so also shall he reap. One of the reasons why people continue to carry on the way they do in life is because they have no sense of responsibility for their actions. But responsibility is important in more ways than one. The Son of Man came not into the world to condemn the world. It isn't that God wants to sort of keep a score on you and then even up with you on the tally. The real purpose of recordings of what a man and woman does in life is so that God can grant you the vibrational patterns in your life that are the vibrational patterns of the saints so that you can ascend out of the socket, this mortal socket. And as Shakespeare said, shuffle off this mortal coil. I read a report recently of a man who had died and then came back to life. The man said that life was so marvelous on the other side that he didn't want to come back. He told of some of his experiences. And he mentioned the fact, he said that all his life he had dreaded death as the most terrifying thing that could happen to him. Well, I suppose that the soul might shudder a bit at the idea of birth because they know they're coming into a world of confinement and misery and all kinds of situations where people in egotism will work out on each other, make it difficult. You know the old story of poor little Arthur at rugby where he kneeled down, you know, by his bed because he was always taught to kneel down and everybody in the barracks there, all the other boys in the boys' school, they all practically laughed at him and then finally they took their shoes because he was praying they threw their shoes at him. 
Well, that's the way the world is because it doesn't understand. It's where we are on the ladder of life. We have a ladder. Jacob dreamed and he saw a ladder going up into heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. So people are born and they create karma, as they say in the Far East. This means we sow our seed. And some of the seeds we sow are good and some of the seeds are bad. And whatever we sow, that we'll reap. And if we don't get it all in one lifetime, it comes back. Why, we couldn't achieve equality in this world of accidents and problems, could we now? We couldn't achieve equality of life experiences if one of us lived to be 10 years old, another to be 30, another to be 50, another to be 75, and some to be 90 or 110. That isn't equality. We are given the gift of eternal life unless we lose our soul. Oh, yes, this can happen. In the second death, man can lose his soul. This means that if we keep on doing wrong things, embodiment after embodiment after embodiment, we are finished, eventually. But we're really not finished. The soul just goes back to God. He takes the imprints that we put on the tape recorder of memory, all of the history of our lives, and he simply says, let's clear it off the record and start the soul all over again and send it fresh back to earth. Maybe it will do a better job next time. Otherwise, people come for thousands and thousands of years, they keep embodying. Most of you in this room have been on this planet at least 12,000 years, and this is true. Some of you many more times than that. Because you see the purpose of our coming to the planet is to graduate, to graduate from the planetary home and eventually in my Father's house are many mansions. To enter one of the mansions, the mansions of dominion, where we can take dominion and power over the elements of our life and not be some kind of a puppet on a string, a monkey, I might say, the monkey of Darwin's evolution, dangling on a string. And we conceive of the fact that we are descended from apes? Well, I will admit that sometimes we may act that way, <laughs> But somehow or other, I can't conceive of the good Lord doing it. And so then, we come back to the matter of Jesus having all of his disciples gathered around him. They were talking about John the Baptist. And so, somebody said, well, how about Elijah the prophet? When's he going to come back again? When's he going to be reborn on this earth? And Jesus said, He's already come. He's already born. And it says, Then understood the disciples that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. That is one recording that they kind of missed when the old priests back a long time ago began trying to tear out of the Bible some of the references. Why can any of you people really imagine in your heart that God compares to some of the pagans, pagan concepts, where you have to take a maiden, a beautiful young maiden, and perch her on the edge of a terrific volcano, and now you're going to shove this beautiful maiden down into this fiery volcano, and she's going to perish down there in order to appease the wrath of the gods. Do you have a god like this? Why, the original teachings of God did not provide that kind of a concept. You know, the old bit which happens to be symbolically true about Adam and Eve in the garden and the snake and the serpent. This is true. It's true because, as St. Paul says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So you see, it is a matter of our minds, what we think. What we think is what we are. And this is what the masters teach us. And what a marvelous gift this is. And there are many references, actually, that rather bring out the teaching of re-embodiment. And we come to the point where we understand the greatness of John the Baptist. I'm going to show you why. In almost all the history of the annals of the Great White Brotherhood, practically no one from this planet ever takes the ascension as Jesus did and goes up to heaven and comes back down again. But Elijah did. He went to heaven in the ascension of the chariot of fire in the full view of Elisha. Elisha, of course, was one of the embodiments of Jesus. 
And Elisha then later come in as Jesus, who was the disciple of Elijah, now becomes the master. And it does show us one thing, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Sometimes in spiritual matters, someone may decide to play tortoise and hare with you. Someone you think is way, way ahead of you, advanced spiritually. You say to yourself, well, if I could only be as good as that person. Let me tell you something. There is no competition in God. We can all be just as good. How can you get better than perfect? And it says right in the Bible, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. We have to understand the beautiful ritual that Jesus performed the last night before his betrayal, how he girded himself around about with a towel and he said, he that will be great among you, let him become the servant of all. He didn't say, everybody you meet on the street, show them that your car can go faster. Show them that you know how to buy smarter clothes or you can uh, follow the system of sort of knocking what they have by wearing more dingy clothes. He didn't say you should try to bring down your fellow men or your cherished institutions or wreak havoc in the world or abuse your body. He didn't talk about any of those things. He said that you should have respect for the temple of God. And he said, know ye not that your body is the temple of God. We should have respect for ourselves because it is a chalice into which the wine of the Holy Spirit is poured. And that is part of the beauty of God. Young and old alike, I say to you tonight that the great white brotherhood and the masters and the eternal and living God in whose image we all were made loves us one and all, and his love is extended to the whole wide world, and there is no need for religious conflict when the truth is known. I attended a meeting out at Fort Carson. The commanding general had asked me to come out with other ministers here in Colorado Springs, and they wanted to serve us coffee and donuts and then luncheon. And while I was out there, I wore a tag with my name on. Most of the ministers in this town did not actually know the name of the organization. We were rather new here at the time. And do you know that there had been some conversation about us in the community here? Not a conversation based upon the actuality of fact, not upon that which is proven in a court of law, but what we call hearsay. And so I was alone at Fort Carson. Individual after individual came up to me and looked at my name tag and one minister even spun on his heels and refused to even speak to me. Do I care? Of course not. Because Jesus said, do good to them that despitefully use you. We must not even have any feelings really about these things. But we should understand that people are where they are. They're where they are. And this is true of all men. You cannot tell me today, you cannot tell yourself, that everybody does not have a certain place upon the ladder of life, for they do. And no one is an exception. No one. A man may be president of the United States and he may lack a great deal of stature. He may be a great chemist in a laboratory and he may lack certain knowledge of, shall we say, microbes. A man may be a school teacher, a professor. He may be a doctor of laws. It does not matter. But he may have areas that he is not familiar with. And one of the most unfortunate things I think in the world, not from my standpoint, because we are here compelled by God's law to stand here and teach the law, I have had people come in here and think that I would tell it all in one night. Why, I heard so much that I had never heard before that he must have told me everything. But we told really very little because there is so much to learn. Sometimes 
when I have actually gone to one of the temples of the Great White Brotherhood in sleep conditions, when my body is asleep, and I have left my body and have gone out during the night to one of the great temples of the Brotherhood where we sit in classes. And in these classes we are given instruction in the laws of God. And then we return. I have marveled, marveled at the extent of the wisdom of the Masters. And I am here to tell you tonight that unless you know these things, you are in meager knowledge. One of the greatest problems in the world today as I see it is the fact that men reach a point of sophistication where they suppose that they know all the answers when they know only a few. There is no experience that happened to Jesus Christ that cannot happen to you. You can heal the sick, you can be healed. You can heal your mind, it can be healed. You can free yourself from boredom. You can free yourself from it by simply finding out that the universe is the most animated place you ever saw in the... Well, it's, there isn't any other, is there? <laughs> you see what I mean? You suddenly find out that it's really animated and literally jumping with energy. And you realize that it has a grand purpose. You're going down a grand hall. You're going into a miracle world. But it's got to be because you know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you will never be free. Never. And you will never get it if you suppose that it's a matter of someone else vicariously paying the price for you. We love Jesus with all our heart. We know that all things were made by him refers to the Christ. And we know that there is a difference between Jesus the man and Jesus the Christ because you can be a Christ. You can be a master, every one of you. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. One of the biggest problems we have in the world today is the accusing finger. Somebody come along and the finger was pointed at me. The finger said, well, do you think you're equal with God? Well, I sure hope we can be. I want to be. But it's not a matter of self-righteousness. It's not a matter of saying that I did it. It's a matter of accepting what he did. And you accept it for yourself. If you don't believe it, you try it. You take it home with you and you see if you start thinking of what would Jesus do? What would God do? What would I do if I had all power? I couldn't be bored. I couldn't feel inadequate. How can you feel inadequate if you have the power of the universe within you? Why, you can't. You've got it there. And what it does for the whole world is so wonderful. It's the harmony of the spheres, the interplanetary radiance, that flows between the planetary bodies. It's the interconnecting link between man and God. You have it. It's the divine image. You aren't hopeless. Sure, some will die physically. But remember, when you do, if you have started to sow your seeds in the right way in life, when you do, you're going to come back in an environment where you can pick up where you left off. You say, why? Because there is a giant computer in heaven. No, IBM, the itty bitty machine company, didn't make it. <laughs> they didn't make it, but God did. And it's a computer that's inherent within nature. It's in the whole structuring of life. And if God sees and the all-seeing eye does see, not in the sense that God is an old man sitting in an antiseptic, chlorophyll, sprayed corner of the universe, but that God is in you. And he can change you. You don't have to worry. He can do such marvelous things with you if you'll only realize that really you're kind of Play-Doh for God. You know how a child sits there on the floor and plays with his Play-Doh and he molds different images? Well, this is very easy. God can mold you, but 
He gave you free will. And he's not about to do it if you don't say something to him. That's one of the laws. You have to invoke what you want. And if you don't believe that this can be done for you, if you think that there isn't any hope for you, or you're going to run around to this church and that church, and you're going to find out. Well, you won't in many places because they're going to tell you that somebody paid the price for you and you're going to say, now because he paid the price, it's all done and it really doesn't matter too much what I do and yet somehow you're a little bit uneasy. You don't think it's a very good insurance policy. And you say to yourself, maybe I better just live a little better. And you, you suppose that you are going to live and be good. And Jesus is saying, why callest thou me good? There's only one good. Well, you can't do it if he couldn't do it. So it has to be the emanation of the first cause or the divine logos pouring forth the divine energy into space from the beginning with the beauty of the first photon of light. All substance is endowed with the substance of God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. It's still true. And it's true of us, all of us. And that is the wonderful thing. That's the wonderful gift of God. Do you see that? We may have a little more light. You know, some people have a little more light than others. Like St. Paul said, one star differs from another star in glory. But... It doesn't say that you can't get more light, does it? If you want it. But of course, in this day of easy lessons and instant life and instant victory and instant achievement, people do not want to expand the effort of themselves. They would rather believe that somebody else did it for them. And what do the masters teach? They teach the science of meditation, of meditating upon the principle of who you are and what you are. So why don't you join me tonight in a little experiment in the science of realizing your true self? Why don't you just believe that there is a perfect image of you and that this is part of the Godhead and that you are actually a sky being rather than an earth being? Do you know what the... Uh, great Magians said when they came, you know, on their camels, we have seen his star in the sky and we are come to worship him. You've got a star there too. There's a star in the heaven world that is your own. It's the star that shone when you were born. And it can grow and grow in magnitude until it's so beautiful. And it signifies that you are a growing divine being entering into your divine inheritance. I don't want to overburden you with too much tonight because there is so much. And it is so wonderful because it is all true and there are so many things that are based on cosmic law that I'm sure your eager young minds and hearts, regardless of your physical age, will want to reach out for You'll want to find it. And so how can you find it a little more? Now I know some of these things may not be realized by all of you. But the Master Jesus, when he was here on earth, spent 33 years before his ascension upon earth. We can account for his early days in Nazareth until the age of 12. But what was he doing in those years between and where was he? There is a legend of Essa that we discovered in India near Kula. And in the legend of Essa, which I don't intend to really tell you, we find out a great deal about Jesus in his travels in India. One of the things that Jesus did was to travel during those years into many of the great temples of the great white brotherhood, Egypt and India and even to the Americas here. He came in a manner that would amaze you. But I want to point out to you that there are many experiences that occurred to Jesus in his travels. 
And one of these experiences, of course, was his familiarity with the mantra of the Far East. The mantra is a vibrational pattern. And when it is spoken, because it has been recited by thousands and millions probably of people, certainly millions and billions and quadrillions and so on of times, we realize that because a living soul was saying it as an act of devotion, the stylus of life has cut an awful deep vibrational pattern. And so the mantra becomes endowed with terrific spiritual power. I am going to allow you tonight, those of you who are here for the first time, as well as those who usually come, to have a little experience with the mantra. Because it has a beneficial act upon your whole being. It is a momentary act of regeneration. It can charge your physical bodies. It can free your mind from some of the comics that occur on Saturday morning, which are basically vibrational patterns of destruction. Did you know that there are war patterns and destructive patterns in many of our comics that occur on the television? We see them as innocent little pastimes, but in reality they're not so innocent because there are forces not so benign in many cases that influence the people who draw them. And you see this is all part of the vibrational pattern that I started to talk about. So we're going to use these mantra tonight, and uh, I think I'll start with a very simple one. And this is a simple mantra which can give you tremendous benefit. If you please separate your hands and your feet so they do not touch, and sit up straight in your chairs, we're going to use one of the most powerful mantras in all of India, which I learned in Rishikesh. This is the Om Namo Naraya Naya. And Naraya Naya from the old ancient writings, as deciphered by James Churchward in his ancient books of Mu, explains to us the cosmic serpent swallowing his tail, which is an allegory based upon Naraya Naya, who is indicative or symbolical of the living God, which shows, of course, that we are all involved with that pattern of spirit, all of us. And it's up to us to grow by our own devotion and the acts of our love and the drawing forth of that divine energy. So we're going to use the Om Namo Narayanaya. Now I'll ask Mrs. Hudson to please take her place at the piano and we will sound this out for you as an experimental motif. sing it alone first. Om Namo Narayanaya, Om Namo Narayanaya, Om Namo Narayanaya, Om Namo Narayanaya. See, now I will ask you all, and I'm going to show you the tremendous power that we generate of a spiritual nature by the singing of this very ancient mantra that goes back before the Jain caves and thousands of years. So will you please join me in the Mantra. Om Namo Narayanaya, 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 Om Namo Narayanaya. I want to explain to some of these young people here in the front row that this is a very deep spiritual science. And please do not laugh at it. You understand what I mean? I mean, this is a very deep spiritual science, and its benefits are genuine. We're glad to have you with us. We want to be sure that you maintain the proper respect, because if you don't, you see it will affect everyone in the room. And if you do, it will affect you for the good, for the best. So please maintain proper respect for this mantra. Please. Om Namo Narayanaya, 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 Om Namo 
temples, we sat on straw mats and chanted these mantras with the sages of India. And I want to tell you tonight that they maintained their chants for as long as a half hour with just one chant. And your first impression as an American who has been taught that this is all there is, is just, you know, get it over with, and that's the end of it. You find at the end of a half hour of this chanting that your body is so charged with spiritual energy and you are able to reach out your consciousness if you experiment with it. And you can see sometimes for a mile or sometimes ten miles, sometimes for hundreds of miles. You know one time, an interesting thing that occurred in my life, I was in the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago. And during the night, I traveled from the hotel in my spiritual body to Paris. And as I was on the way to Paris, I came to the Empire State Building. And I was very much a novice. I had very little experience at all in traveling outside the body. And so I saw that huge ball on top where the aerial for the early television was placed. And so I actually stepped on it and then <coughs> As I was standing on it, I got the silly idea that I was in the physical. And it was a very foggy night, and I fell off of it and toppled into the fog, expecting to be dashed into pieces. And then I said to myself, this is ridiculous. This is nothing but a dream. So the next morning, I went down to have my breakfast in the Blackstone Hotel, and I was sitting there having my Kadoda figs and a few other things. And uh, suddenly, I looked uh, crossed about 10 feet away, and there was a little old lady in a white dress. And uh, she had the funniest little smile to her face, and I thought, what in the world is she doing? Why is she looking at me like that? And she kept grinning this sort of a Mona Lisa smile, you know. <laughs> and so suddenly she turned to me and she said, I saw your foot slip last night on the Empire State Building. <laughs> and this really happened. And I'm telling you, I had chills going up and down my spine. <laughs> that which I thought was a dream. And you know, it's kind of silly, really. I mean, we get in all these stereotypes that we say to ourselves, well, this isn't real, this can't happen. But it can and it does. Because man is a spiritual being. So now I'm going to give you one more mantra and then I'm going to give you a brief meditation. This one will be quite difficult and most of you will not be able to follow it. And this is a, a very important mantra, but we have quite a few that can follow it. It's Om Triyambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushtivardhanam Urwa Ukamiva Bandinat. Now we'll give it together. Om Triyambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushtivardhanam Urwa Ukamiva This too is quite beneficial 
And the longer you chant it, the more power you draw down. May I have a brief meditation with you before I close my service? We ask at this time that you do not feel that you are a body, that you recognize that you are a soul, that your soul is of the divine nature and thus omnipresent with God. You are everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in the universe. The consciousness of God is with you. You are not confined to a physical body. You are a free soul, born free, free still. And as you realize this, try to feel the light energy that interpenetrates cosmos and try to realize the power of single eye vision focalized in the cyclops eye in the center of your forehead. And from this word comes encyclopedia. That is the source of knowledge, the pineal gland in the physical body. It's the source of spiritual knowledge in contact with the great hierarchy of light. O oh, our Father, who art in heaven, we open our consciousness to the great continents of the air, the power of thy omnipresence. We are one with thee, long involved in ourselves as a human snarl, a ball of yarn, an entangled skein, of ego and identity, we ask that we may receive, that our individual soul may flow as the eternal Tao out into the universe where thou art everywhere omnipresent. Let us contact in our consciousness those benign beings that are aware of their oneness with thee. In the beginning we came forth with the perfect levitating sense of the vision of thy being everywhere as one being. We were not separate but one in consciousness. Let this now then be our return gift to thy heart, a passport to our true identity. Let us in consciousness journey to the place where the Lord lay, everywhere thou art, and there is no place that thou art not. We are aware then of the rings of Saturn. We are aware of Mars, Jupiter, of Neptune, of the hosts of suns that compose our system. We are aware of these spatial galaxies and of the permeation of thy omnipresence there. No longer then glamorized by the manifestation of ourself, we seek thee as bliss and joy and peace and the abundant consciousness. For forever is forever, and we shall always be thy children, for we will it so. Consciously we ask that all desire that we have had to glamorize, to glorify, to serve the outer self, be removed from our heart and replaced by the desire to serve the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. 
Let us grow in grace and the knowledge of thyself and the ascended host and keep us ever in the hollow of thy eternal hand. For thou guidest the sparrow through the air. Thou receivest our winged prayer. Thou art God, the essence of true being. And as we speak thy name, I am Nuk Pa Nuk. As thou appeared long ago to Moses saying, I am that I am, Om Tat Sat. So be it, eternal Father strong to save through the love of the cosmic Christ let it be given to each heart and let it be a continuing search until the grail of consciousness be filled with the Holy Spirit and the complement of thy eternal grace in the name of Jesus the Christ Amen Will you join me in a closing hymn? The song we will sing together, and you may remain seated, is Meta Dear. It's to the tune of Faith of Our Fathers and is to be found on page 58. peace of your presence flow through days of service and nights of rest may the peace of your presence keep you blessed the sign of the heart the head and the hand to you may 
Jesus and Gautama's cosmic cross of white fire. Watch between thee and me as we are absent one from the other and ever present with our God. Peace be upon you. Thank you.